what I'd like to do now is build on Maria's uh, conversation. Um, we're going to focus specifically on racial dynamics in schools and try to pay attention to how some of these patterns of inequality um, in educational outcomes, looking at both national data um, and data specific to Illinois, um, can be framed in a broader context. And then Amanda will spend some time talking about um, specifically what happens in an integrated context. For the last 60 years or so, we've looked at educational outcomes and disparities with the focus on integration. And what we'll talk a little bit about, um, or what Amanda will talk a little bit about is how integration, um, there are challenges related to integration, even in a context where schools are desegregated. So let me begin with a bit of data on racial disparities, looking at the National Assessment of Education Progress. Um, the NAEP is considered um, the nation's report card on school achievement. And so one of the um, things that we've looked at and tracked over time is the achievement of African-American and white students, African-American and Latino students, and looked at the score gaps. So between 1971 and 2008, there was um, some closing of the white-black gap at age 13 on reading average scale scores. In 1971, it was 39% um, or 39 scale score point difference. Uh, by 2008, um, that gap had closed to 21 scale score points. Likewise, when we look at the scores for Hispanic and white students on the NAEP uh, between 1975 and 2008, we see a decrease in the gaps, but we can recognize that these gaps in scale score points uh, still exist. Uh, for for students. We can also think about these differences by looking at um, the uh, high school transcript study, which looked at 38,000 transcripts of 41,000 students and looked at the average um, GPAs of students when they graduated between 1990 and 2009. What we see here is that Asian students average GPA was 3.26. Um, White students came in slightly lower with 3.09, Hispanic students at 2.84, and African American students at 2.69. So that's another way to think about these gaps, and we can see, again, a hierarchy in terms of race and ethnicity in terms of how students do academically. So if we look at the um, data from the um, ISAT test, again, we see similar patterns. Uh, with the percent needing, uh, meeting or exceeding uh, standards, um, there exists a gap between black and white students in both mathematics and reading. So this first slide is on mathematics, slide number five, and slide number six um, is the, the reading gap. Again, there's a gap between African American and white students, um, percentage meeting, and, uh, meeting or exceeding standards. Likewise, if we look at the ISAT test for Latino uh, white gaps, we also see that these gaps exist over time between 2005 and 2014 in both reading and mathematics. Finally, if we think about these scores, um, test scores, we can also think about educational attainment, which is very important for um, what students ultimately earn um, if they've received a bachelor's degree and also for voting uh, behavior, participation in volunteer activities, et cetera. If we look at the differences across um, racial and ethnic groups, what we see is that Asian uh, Pacific Islanders um, have the highest graduation, college graduation rates among 25 to 29 year olds at about 60%. Whites come in slightly behind them with uh, rates about 40%. African-Americans about 25% and Hispanics below 20% uh, at about 17%. So again, these gaps in terms of educational attainment reflect similar gaps in grades, test scores, and other indicators of educational achievement. And why this is important in one sense is very important because demands for jobs and the qualifications for jobs have gone up substantially. In 1973, only 28% of jobs required some college education. Uh, by 2007, nearly 60% of jobs required some kind of some level of college education, at least some college um, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, or master's degree or higher. So we know that if we have these racial and ethnic gaps in our um, educational achievement and educational outcomes and attainment, 
that has implications for how well prepared people are to fill the jobs that, that are most desirable in the society. And again, an education system that doesn't teach all students well uh, runs the risk of not serving the nation well and clearly not serving certain populations well. So one question is what accounts for these outcomes and how does it relate to sort of issues of residential um, segregation? Well, we can think about, first of all, income and wealth disparities. One way that we measure inequality across the society and stratification across society is to think about the differences between the median wealth holdings of families from different racial groups. What this slide shows is in wealth disparity in 1984, uh, between 1984 and 2007. And what it shows based on work by Thomas Shapiro at Brandeis is that in 1984, um, the gap um, between black and white wealth was $20,000 in median wealth holdings. By 2007, it was $95,000. Likewise, if we look at just income itself, we see that between 1945 and 2008, um, folks in the 80th percentile had substantial income growth compared to folks at the 20th percentile of income. Between 1977 and 2008, there was a 34% growth in income for people at the 80th percentile. And then um, between 2007 and uh, 1977 and 2008, there was a 7% growth among folks in the 20th percentile. And why this matters in part is because of the kinds of educational investments people are able to make, both based on their wealth and based on their income. Uh, what this uh, slide shows is Duncan and Renane's work um, in the book, Wither Inequality, where they show that there have been substantial growth at the top of the income distribution in comparison to the growth at the lower end of the income distribution. At the top quintile, there's been substantial growth in terms of educational investments outside of school, in terms of extracurricular activities, summer trips, and other kinds of investments. At the lower end of the income distribution, there has not been as much growth and that widening gap in income has also led to a widening gap in the kinds of investments that parents are able to make. And we also know that there's a high correlation between racial um, background and income. We also have already seen um, from Maria's uh, discussion that when we take racial background and we map it onto residential segregation, like we see in Chicago, Joliet, Mount Prospect, and other cities, in Illinois, that also leads to other challenges that relate to schools that I'll now talk about. One is that when you have a high concentration of Black um, and Latino students in particular schools, there tends to be a higher concentration of low-income students in those schools. So if we look at city schools in particular, um, the percentage of um, students in high poverty schools, Black students make up 46% of students in cities in high poverty schools and Latino students make up 47% uh, of students in high poverty schools, where 75% of more students are receiving free and reduced price lunch. Why that matters is in part is because as the poverty rate increases, uh, the percentage of students receiving free and reduced lunch increases, academic achievement tends to go down. And there are a number of reasons why this might happen, but as you can see from this slide, there's a decrease in mathematics scores on the National Assessment of Education Progress for both middle-income students and low-income students in schools with higher percentages of poverty. Another issue is the way schools are funded. You would expect for funding to, in some sense, increase as the poverty rates go up. But what this slide shows is that when we compare Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, if you follow the blue line, what we see here is the per people expenditures in Illinois decrease as the percentage of poverty goes up, whereas in Minnesota, um, the per people expenditures go up if you follow the green line. So what we have in, in Illinois is a situation where um, funding also maps onto the percentage of poverty of folks in schools, largely because state and local funding is so critical uh, to the way schools are funded in Illinois. Finally, another issue is the distribution of high quality teachers. What we find is that in schools with the highest percentage of minority students, we also find teachers with the lowest levels of quality. So what this shows is research that looked at five indicators of high quality teachers. 
and mapped it on to the percentage of minority students in those schools. What we find is that when we uh, break down by um, quintiles, those teachers in the lowest quintile for quality are located in the schools with the highest percentage of minority students. So in schools with 90 to 98 percent uh, minority students, 70 percent of teachers fall in the lowest quintile of quality. I'm sorry, the, the uh, lowest quartile of quality. In the 99 to 100 percent minority schools, 88 percent of, of teachers fall into the lowest quartile. Likewise, if we look at the distribution of teachers across schools based on income, what we see is that in schools that are 50 to 89 percent low income, 44 percent of teachers are in the lowest um, lowest quartile, and in schools that are 90 to 100 percent low income, 84 percent of teachers fall into the lowest um, quartile. So what that suggests is that um, patterns of income and wealth inequality and the distribution of students across schools leads to students being concentrated in schools with lower quality. But it also, uh, what I think what Amanda will sort of pick up on are other things that account for these gaps in educational outcomes that are endemic to specific experiences in integrated schools. So I want to turn it over to Amanda to talk about um, integrated schools and the specific experiences based on work that we've been doing together. 